So I'd like you to welcome to the cutting edge of education, where the synergy of technology and academia is reshaping the landscape of learning. In the realm of higher education, one phenomenon stands out as a game changer. And this is generative artificial intelligence, or Gen AI. Imagine a world where AI doesn't just assist, but actively contributes to the creation of educational content, sparking innovation in ways previously deemed unimaginable. As we delve into the realm where algorithms meet academia, prepare to be intrigued as the statistics paint a picture of a future where generative AI isn't just a tool, it is an indispensable partner in the pursuit of knowledge. Buckle up, because the journey into the transformative world of generative AI in higher education is about to begin. Um, I will say that I had, if you couldn't tell, um, I used ChatGPT to write that intro for me, a very easy, uh, basic way of using ChatGPT. But I will say that it cut down my introductory like, um, research by about an hour and a half to two hours. Not because of that, because that wouldn't have taken me that long, but I will show you some statistics later on uh, that ChatGPT helped me find. Um, so hopefully you all are in the right place. Uh, this is the uh, workshop Embracing AI Using Generative AI to Facilitate Dynamic and Interactive Learning. Uh, my name is Matt. I am the Program Director of Educational Development. Sorry, my title has changed like four times in the past year, so I can't keep it straight sometimes. Um, and I am with the Division of Teaching Excellence and Innovation. And we have two wonderful panelists who we will, uh, I will be introducing to you in just a couple minutes. Um, but our main goal today is to identify strategies for using generative AI to facilitate dynamic and interactive uh, learning activities in the classroom. I want to start by talking to you about some statistics uh, that was um, yeah, back, in, back in 2023. It's like three weeks ago. So in 2023, uh, these are some interesting Gen AI statistics. Um, the first is that over 60% of higher education institutions integrated Gen AI into their curriculum development. And those courses that use Gen AI actually increase their student engagement and retention um, by about 30%. Um, and also that 45% of scholarly articles um, were co-authored by generative AI systems. And you can see that in the author block. Um, at DTI, we do have a statement on the use of Gen AI. Uh, if you want to look at the QR code, uh, or if you scan the QR code, it'll take you to this web page. Um, but we do have some language on there about the use of Gen AI in the classroom, as well as some guidelines and some questions for you to consider um, as you're thinking about integrating Gen AI in higher education. But to give you an idea of how Gen AI has been used in higher ed, um, these are just some ways that they've been used. So content creation, uh, curricular developments, uh, personalized learning, which I think we'll hear a little bit about today. Uh, language translation and tutoring. This is um, oftentimes pretty close to real time. Uh, research and writing assistance, uh, simulation and virtual labs. Uh, so this is something that um, if you're familiar with teaching, for example, a large lecture for biology or something, and you need to have a lab section, it's very difficult to find lab spaces. So oftentimes, Gen AI, Gen AI has been used uh, for the virtual lab space, which has been pretty interesting to see. Um, automated assessment and grading, um, and art and media. Now, I don't want you to take my word for it, because literally all I did was I went to ChatGPT, and I typed in, how is Gen AI being used in higher education? And it gave me all of the bullet points, as well as some examples of each. Uh, one thing that I want to note, though, is that a follow-up to this question, because I pulled all of the statistics from like, how often Gen AI, Gen AI was used um, and all the institutional statistics, I asked, do you have references for this? Or can you show me where the source material was? And ChatGPT said, nope, I can't. Um, and it did not give me any references for that. So take everything that I've just said with a ginormous grain of salt. Um, and I think that's a lesson that when students are using Gen AI, um, at least in, for my own class, I teach a molecular biology class, I encourage them and, and teach them how to use the tool. But I always tell them that you always have to be careful with what Gen AI is telling you, because oftentimes they're, they're pulling from the public knowledge that's available on the internet. Um, if you can't get sources for all of this, like you have to be very careful with how you present the material. And that's why in our classes, uh, we tend to have people just always cite their sources. So if they're using Gen AI, that's fine to start. Um, but 
uh, they do need to uh, be able to pull some actual data and actual references. And we'll hear a little bit about that today um, in, uh, with our two uh, panelists. So with that, um, our two panelists, I'll introduce them to you. We have Adrienne Williams, who's the Assistant Professor of Teaching in Devon Cell. Um, she'll be uh, speaking first. And then we have Amal Alashkar, um, who is a Professor of Teaching in the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences. Um, the way this is going to work is that each one of our panelists will uh, present to you how they use Gen AI in their own classes. And then afterwards, um, for those of you who use the registration form, I curated um, the most popular questions that were on there. And we'll be going through them one by one if we have time. And then we will open it up um, to everybody. Oh, goodness. Fake microphone. Uh, and then we will open it up to everybody just in case you have any additional questions after that, followed by a wrap up. And then we'll send you on your way to enjoy your weekend. Sound good? All right, let's do it. All right, thank you everyone for attending. I'm glad that you are here. Um, I am going to talk about a class that I teach and an uh, AI activity that I've run twice now. Uh, this is a shot that I took Monday morning of my class. So this is what my students look like in Bio 100. My plan for my 20 minutes here is to talk to you about the format of this particular course, talk about why I decided to try and use AI, run through the checklist of what I wanted to accomplish using the tool, talk about the activity, and then talk about some assessment I did on the activity. So that's the plan going forward. So Bio 100 is a large lecture writing class is not an oxymoron. Uh, it's really more of a reading class. It's a required course for bio size students. And I have 200 to 400 students, depending on the quarter. Um, they tend to be third year students, so they have survived their first two years in their bio -sci major. The format of the course is every week we read a new scientific journal article on a different biological topic, and we spend class time discussing how articles are put together and about how this particular article matches that format. At the end of every week, they'll take a paper quiz, we call it, on that paper where they have to write about the biology and figures associated with that paper. So mostly it's about how to read, and they demonstrate that they have learned how to read by doing a small amount of writing. Um, What's interesting about this particular writing class is all the writing occurs during class time. It's the reading they do beforehand. Um, and I also have undergraduate learning assistants who roam during the class. You can actually see them. They're the people standing up around. As students are working on their activities, the learning assistants are walking around helping. This is an example of one third of a paper quiz. They, every Friday, they get three questions, boom, 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 on a Google Doc, and they have to write their answer in the box next to the question. And so they write about this amount, three times this amount for a paper quiz. That's an example of the kind of writing that they have to do. And unless you are an expert on myostatin and muscle and bone loss and microgravity, you probably find this to be a little bit obscure and mysterious. And the students did too when they walked in that week. They spent the week learning about this material so that they could write about it. So none of them knew anything about myostatin and activin A either uh, beforehand. And you can see there's a lot of um, jargon, terms, names of molecules, names of proteins, things that we don't expect students to know walking into class. So the primary course objective for this class is that students be able, by the end of class, to figure out how to write about a paper. They be, need to be able to understand the hypothesis, explain that, and they need to be able to explain the results of any particular reasonable biology paper that they're given. That's my goal for the course. And what students generally have difficulty is, well, that because otherwise, why would there be a class on it? So they have difficulty writing concisely and clearly about a new biological topic. And many of them also have a lot of difficulty with the biology of the paper. Okay, they come theoretically having nailed down the basics of biology, but biology is a very amoebic sort of uh, concept. And so there's a lot of parts to it. And not everybody's awesome at all the parts. And so that brings us to why I want to use AI, is can it help my students be more effective at these particular goals? 
And also, I really wanted to know, were they going to be able to use AI to do my paper quizzes and cheat? Right? Like on a practical level, I felt like I needed to understand the, the way the tool worked so I would know how it would affect my class and my students. I mean, let's just be honest about that sort of thing. That's what I really wanted to know. Can it help my students? And is it going to help them a little too much? So I started doing some research. Um, a lot of, a couple of the podcasts that I regularly listen to anyway started talking about AI, bringing on guests, and so I started to learn about it then. Um, I started looking up YouTube videos on AI tools for scientific research. I was particularly interested in what can AI do to help people read and write journal articles as a particular tool. Um, I'm looking at teaching and learning center websites, how to use AI for resources. Um, and what I found is YouTube was probably the most effective way to find out information about AI. Found that out. The second thing was there are way too many tools. Like people need other hobbies because they literally invented 35 new AI tools to help people who read and write um, scientific literature do those things. And so that was exhausting. Um, and I think that would probably be true for anybody who's kind of stepping into this field. These do different things. And so a lot of what I did was spend time watching YouTube videos trying to figure out what is this doing and will it help my students. And a lot of my research then just kind of was me trying to figure out what matters for this class. And I created a checklist. So I'll share that with you, not because it's your checklist, but because it's an example of if you are going to teach, you will probably end up trying to create something similar. Um, because to give away the punchline, ChatGPT is not a great tool for what I needed. And so that forced me to look at other tools and that brought me to a checklist. I need students to get a benefit from it Nothing irritates students more than a pointless activity. So I wanted it to be something that would help them, but also not be a tool that would be immediately, obviously usable for cheating. Like, just to be honest, I, I wanted it to not train them how to look up answers to the paper quizzes. Um, I needed the tool to be something that students could use in like 40 minutes, from like a dead stop to a successful conclusion because I do my activities in class. I didn't want it to be a homework activity. Uh, I use ALP. I'm in the Anteater Learning Pavilion, so students have devices with them, and that's helpful. But I had to not require a large login procedure or a big download onto their computer. I really wanted it to be free, and the world being what it is, I wanted it to remain free. And that's another problem with these kind of startup AI tools is they tend to go to a subscription model. And so I didn't want to pick something that was going to immediately become either dead or expensive for my students. So that was important to me. Data privacy is a thing with AI tools. Most of them pretty much tell you, if anybody were to bother to read the information inside, that they graciously accept whatever you put in them and keep it for part of their language training models. And I don't know that my students are going to put anything particularly valuable in there, but I'd also you know, prefer a tool that wasn't scamming them or scraping their information or doing other mysterious things. I'd like it to be at least vaguely up and up as much as possible. Um, and so the main thing I decided I would like help with was to help students just understand the papers. So actually, not even so much how to write. So I'm sorry if you came hoping that I'd explain how AI can help students write. That would be a different panelist. I am going to explain how my students are helping, are learning how to read because of AI. Because that was the thing that I felt my students needed most. So I ended up picking the tool, uh, the, the Microsoft AI chat. Um, my first time I used this was in fall 2023, so just, you know, like literally six months ago, and it's already changed names. 
So it was the Edge browser with Microsoft Bing chat when I started this. It is now called Copilot. So like literally, every time you turn around, something will be different about the tool. I decided to use Edge browser and Microsoft Copilot. And this is why. ChatGPT wasn't going to work for me because if you ask ChatGPT about a scientific journal article, it will say, I'm sorry, I cannot read that. The paid version can see it, right? Or it can see which? If you pay for it. Um, ah, maybe if you pay for it, yeah, which brings us back to the, if you pay for it, maybe it has access. Um, you could upload text from the paper. But for various reasons, that just it just wasn't the flavor I was looking for for an AI tool. Um, Edge, the, the, I'll call it Copilot from now. Copilot will actually provide its references, um, which is rare in the AI world. It has vague data privacy. Um, the interesting thing I found out now that I just ran it for a second time just this past week was it will only give you data privacy if you are faculty or staff. You log in with your UCI Microsoft account and it says, hello, I'm so glad to see you. All of your data is private. Please ask 30 queries. But if you were a student and you log in with your UCI Microsoft account, it turns off the chat. It says, go away. So I'm like, oh, well, that's not very helpful. So I actually have to have students either log in with a personal Microsoft account, which can be for free for anybody. You, know, you just have to use your Gmail or whatever and create one, or just use it not logged in. So that was interesting. Oh, wait, I got to the, the cons already. I have to put this up. But it is free, it is likely to remain free, and it has operating system options for students. So those are the pros. The cons, as I've already kind of given away my story, is it is not inherently set up for UCI students. I've talked to OIT about this, and they say, Microsoft, it's a Microsoft rule, that they are considering allowing students over 18 access. which I, I, like, I don't understand why they don't. But anyway, that is something that is currently like something that they're working on. Um, all of my students are like, what, what's Edge? So poor, poor Microsoft. Um, you don't actually need Edge to use this. You can just use Copilot in its own browser window. But the main thing that I like to use it for is you can actually open a journal article in Edge and have Copilot open next to it and ask Copilot about the paper. And it can see the paper. It can see whatever web page that you're looking at and answer questions about it. And that's what I wanted for my class, the paper, and for the chat to be able to ask about the paper, for me to be able to ask the chat about the paper. Um, so aside from Microsoft completely not wanting students uh, to access it yet, so there's a little bit of a workaround there still, it works well. Okay. And again, I can have 400 students, and so having a tool that will work is really important. I don't have a lot of time to spend. I mean, there's, there's learning assistants and I, and we can get around and help students, but still, having things work is super helpful. So this is a QR code to the activity that I use in the class. I'm happy to send it to you. If you don't want to wave your phone at it right now, it is a Google Doc. I use Google Docs every single day. Students come in, they sit down, they open up a Google Doc, and they work on the activity questions within that Google Doc every day. So students are very accustomed to this format. They understand how it works, and I can then upload their resulting PDFs to Gradescope for the TAs to grade. So that's why it's got kind of an interesting format for the name and ID at the top. And why I use those table forms in Google Docs is because Gradescope can find the student answers in there. Uh, you don't have to look at it because I'll just tell you what's in there. It's instructions on how to open Edge and Copilot. That's actually at the end of the doc. So if you're curious, you could do that yourself. You could go download Edge and Copilot. And there, here are my practice prompts. Again, my goal is can students use this AI activity to better understand the biology of the paper that we're working on this week. So it has to be an activity that can be revamped every time I teach the class to whatever the paper is we're doing that quarter during that week. And so I just scan through it and find some random complicated biology questions and give that as a starter activity question and then ask them to find a few more. Um, and the other thing is 
really the benefit to AI for these students beyond, say, Google? Because you can also Google any of the names of these molecules or enzymes or whatever, and I often do. Um, it will sometimes do a nice job of actually explaining the information, plus it provides references so students can go look at the actual information. But the benefit to the AI is you can ask it to simplify, or you can ask it to combine. Or for my students, I can say, you can ask it to translate it into a different language. So if your language that you're most comfortable with is not English and you're still struggling to make that transition to learning both biology and English, go ahead and have it explain things to you in whatever your, your language that you're more comfortable is. That's the main benefits beyond Google, is being able to take that information and synthesize it, perhaps simplify it, perhaps you know, have it at a high school level, um, and change it to a different language if you want. These are things that the AI tool can do that just Google can't, that I find particularly helpful. But you understand that like this is a small subset of AI. They are, they are not using Dolly to invent images. They are not creating writing with it. They're not editing writing with it. Like They are just learning this one tool to learn biology, which I think is a really important thing for them to know how to do. And so I'm just focusing on that during the 40 minutes. Um, I also do a little bit of ethics work at the end of the worksheet. So if you downloaded the, where you can see at the end what is an appropriate use, what isn't, what have you used it for in the past, that kind of thing, just to kind of remind students. And, and they know, like they, they understand. An ethical use is to better understand the paper, and an unethical use is to use it to answer your quiz questions. But it's, it never hurts to like point that out, just in case. Okay. Um, I do assessment on activities when I create these crazy ideas because I want to know how well they're working. Um, I use the mid-quarter evaluation tool in the coursework and I just ask them things. And so this particular question was, um, if I give you the goal, the goal was helping students better understand scientific papers, how would you rate this activity? And I'm not sure how well you can see. One was did not meet the goal, seven was fully met the goal, and 66% uh, of the class gave it a six or a seven. So, you know, it wasn't universally loved, but generally speaking, students are like, it's cool, it's fine. Has your use of generative AI to help you understand the papers increased because of the activity? I asked. So there was a short answer part of the evaluation. Some students said yes, makes it easier to comprehend. Um, Bing Chat, again, that's what it was called back then. I can give it access to the actual article. Um, sometimes I need more background context in the paper. AI allows me to ask questions and connect it to the paper itself. Okay. Um, sometimes no. Not benefit of my understanding because the tool struggles to answer specific questions. I was never a fan of AI because it's known for being wrong. I still don't use it. Um, I still would rather use ChatGPT. Also fine. Okay, I'm, I'm not pushing this. I just want to make sure that all students in my class have a basic understanding of how to turn it on and use it because I don't want there to become a bigger divide between people who are tech comfortable getting really good at a tool where students that are anxious about the tech fall further and further behind. Like that is something I would like to not happen because of my class. So I want everybody to at least figure out how to try it, and at least they know it's there and can think about how to use it more going forward. Um, and then I asked, how did you use the tool? Um, so I used it to ask about paper that, parts of the paper that are hard to identify, understand specific words I didn't understand, to look up concepts in the paper I didn't know, explain the biology of the paper, explain the meaning of X and Y axis on the figures. You can ask the tool to explain figures to you. Um, and so this was, this was what I wanted them to do, and at least they knew enough to tell me that that's what they were doing with it, so that was reassuring. So my goals were small, and I feel like it, they were pretty well met by the tool and the format of the activity. So I will end by just saying um, the suggestions that I have, and I think I'll be kicked off here and we'll go switch to Amal, but write down your questions if you've got questions so you can ask afterwards so we can make sure to get the two talks in. You, you, oh, okay. 
He, he wants me to, to answer questions? Yeah. Oh boy. Um, you are gonna have to look stuff up. This is not the iPhone of the technology world. It will not just work. You are going to have to do research on it. You really should understand the data privacy issues associated with it um, before you have students use this tool. It is not a neutral tool. So just, it is, it, I, I encourage you to do the reading on it. And you will have to keep doing the reading. It is at a stage where it is flailing wildly and tools are going in and out and things are changing regularly. At first, I was like, oh, I don't need to worry about ChatGPT. It can't read journal articles. Nobody could be able to cheat on my paper quizzes. And then like a month later, the new ChatGPT comes out and it can read journal articles. So you're gonna probably have to keep up anyway. Figuring out how you can fold it into with your students is probably helpful. Um, I would recommend keeping the use tight, cozy, figure out something that will really help your students and there's focus on that. Um, and it's also very helpful to do it in class. That worked really well for me. I had 12 learning assistants and I, we could walk around, we could problem solve, we could make sure students were successful during that time and that was a benefit to having the space in the class. Um, so thank you, that's my presentation, and I will go ahead and take questions. Did you have a question mark? In your previous slide you had, um, I use ChatGPT. Are they just associating all AI with ChatGPT? Uh, the question is, when people write ChatGPT in the assessment, do they mean Bing slash Copilot or ChatGPT? My impression is they actually already were using ChatGPT and decided to keep using actual ChatGPT. Uh, most students have not used other tools when I talk to them. Um, any other questions about this particular activity before? Raji. Um, when the paper that they're reading is in your area, how are the answers uploaded? None of the papers we're reading are in my area. I always am just picking various biology thing, uh, topics that are doable. And if it's doable on my me, that's a good start. Um, it's not that they, the question is, how good are the answers within Copilot? Generally, they tend to be basic. If the students ask, like our most recent paper was asking about respiratory exchange ratio, super niche. But there's many things that are abbreviated RER, and chat, the, the chat didn't know unless asked specifically about the paper which RER that we were particularly asking about. And then if we said ask, what is RER in this paper? It usually was able to figure out, oh, respiratory exchange ratio, but it never really explained to students, this is a tool that researchers use that it combines oxygen consumption and CO2 production in order to determine which food source was being consumed by the patients. Like it didn't give the information that students needed but didn't know they needed necessarily. So in that particular case, it did not amaze me. But if you ask this, the, the chat, can you summarize the paper for me? It can, and it does a pretty good job of summarizing the whole paper. So it can get a sense for what's going on in a full paper, enough that hopefully then students can then figure out, oh, okay, I still don't know what the name of this protein is, let me go look into that. So it was rarely wrong, and it does provide references. So if it was wrong, you could immediately tell it was wrong and you could just try and figure out better ways to ask. That's, that is how it is right now for students. Danny? Did you? Yeah, I was wondering more about um, your criteria for not making it easy to cheat. Um, if you could explain how that worked here and or is, it, is it what you're describing right now where it's pretty good but not too good? So far, here again is an example of the kind of question I ask. And I often ask, what is the experimental hypothesis of this paper? And you would think, well, every scientist knows a hypothesis. But I actually have kind of a specific scaffold that I want students in this class to write a hypothesis in. I want it to contain a prediction. I want it to contain a comparison to the control. It has to name the important variables. Like, I have rules that Copilot doesn't know about. And so if students were to try and paste this in to a chat and ask, the answer would not be awesome. Now I will say, I have, all my exams are in Canvas and they all went remote during COVID and I had left them remote 
So students could take their exams anywhere until ChatGPT came along. And I'm like, you know what? I would prefer they be a little less tempted to try to have paper quiz be answered by the AI. The AI. And so I invited everybody to come back and take their paper quizzes in person. So I have not solved that. Um, I haven't modified the format too much, other than I too tend to ask relatively specific questions, and the chat is not yet awesome at answering them. Um, but really, the solution is not so much which tool to use as it is having them take the exam in class. So they take the exam in class, but on paper? It's typed. It's a Google Doc. They just okay. type and download the PDF after they've typed it on the Google Doc. Are people walking around? To yeah. See yeah, we're just walking around. Okay. And again, you know, they could. I don't mind them, and I tell them, they can have the AI open, they could ask it stuff. And I just tell them, just, just don't have it, don't paste the question into the chat. And they're like, we know. And so, you know, like, I, and as we best we can tell them. They don't trust it. Generally speaking, they do not think it is the answer to all their problems in Bio 100. Um, but at least they know how to look up respiratory exchange ratios. Yeah. And, have it explained to them in Spanish if that would help. One last question. So you said your students are typically third year about mm -hmm. Do you think that they, they, what you just said about not trusting the AI is something I've been thinking about a lot. And when you just said that, I thought, is there, do you think that there's a connection between them being more advanced students and not trusting the AI because perhaps they have a little bit more confidence in their abilities or they're a little bit more familiar So the question is, is because they are a third year student, given them enough maturity that they recognize the weaknesses of the tool and are a little bit more responsible about using well, there's it? there's a confidence aspect to it too, if they're a little bit older, if they've been in school a lot longer. Compared to say first year students? Right. I teach first year writing. So in my mind, I'm like, oh no, red flag, don't touch. And I, I just feel like, I wonder if that's part of it, if there's a correlation between, or if, 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 is there a connection between maybe having a little bit more confidence or more exposure to what they're working on the question is, are they, are they feeling more confident with their content and their understanding of how to move forward and so they can feel like I don't need that as much? I would suspect if you surveyed all levels of students in this class, they would all say you can't trust ChatGPT about the same amount. That would be my guess. My other Bio 100 fans, would you guess that that would be similar, I think? I would imagine first year students would also no, I would guess, and it's pretty much a guess, maybe 30% of students use ChatGPT more than once but when they come in the class, and maybe a much smaller percentage use it regularly. So I don't think they're speaking from experience. I think they're just like, we hear it's questionable. And some students are either like, but I'm going to use it, or they're like, but I, so therefore I'm not. Like, that the decision point happens similarly. So I don't know that there's a big year three difference. I would imagine it would be more similar. Yeah, so just to piggyback off that, as part of our FATE project, which was looking at alternative assessments, uh, we did poll students and ask them about how concerned they were with using ChatGPT um, in the classes. And we looked at different levels um, of students, your first years, third years, fourth years, and we didn't really see any sort of difference between the different levels. Yeah. So. I'd love to say third years are much more mature, but I don't know that they are. All right, let's go ahead and switch over to Mo. Let me get back to the end of my talk. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. OK, thank you, everyone, for coming. And um, I will present the implementation of AI, particularly ChatGPT, in three of my classes. And, oops, okay. So I teach undergrad um, and I teach master and PharmD and PhD. So I choose three classes. Uh, one is undergrad course, and this is one of our major uh, courses for the PharmSci um, uh, major. 
Uh, this is big uh, class, like around 100, and it is in person. Uh, the other class is uh, online, and it's like around 60 students. And usually students take this class after molecular pharmacology. And then the third class is principles of pharmacology. This is PharmD course. This is second year PharmD course. And it's in person. And I have around 48 uh, students. So I will talk about, so I have always platforms for each course that I teach, regardless if it is in person or, in, uh, or online. And usually assignments are done on Canvas. So I, I always use the same template, the same format, weeks as uh, modules. And let me see. So I will start with uh, molecular pharmacology. As I said, this is undergrad and this is in person. And uh, this course uh, I taught last spring. So that was my first uh, experience in ChatGPT. Uh, and then I do want to force a lot because I want to try it and see how I can use it. So that's why I use it as incentive, like two extra points, especially for those who didn't do well in the midterm. And then, as you see, I, I wanted them to dig, not only to ask ChatGPT and then get me the answer. I want them to have meaningful conversation and to reflect on their own um, uh, uh, learning. So that's why So I ask them to identify a complex pharmacology topic. In this course, I teach uh, mechanisms of drugs. So very much like deep, like how the drug acts on the receptors or on, on, on specific targets. So, and we, we uh, speak about different types of drugs, uh, drugs that work in the brain, drugs work on, on hormones or cancer, but all very much like molecular, at the molecular level. So the question was just like pick up any uh, topic that you felt like a little bit more complex than others and then have conversation with chat GBT, so meaningful uh, conversation. So when you ask question and you get answer, you dig further. And that's, and I asked to copy and paste all their interactive. So I wanted to see how they are interacting with uh, ChatGPT. And then this is example, of course, this is very long. Like this is only, uh, I, I put two uh, questions, but it might be like 20 questions here. So as you see here, uh, so I wanted them to follow up with question. For example, the, the first question, I think uh, it was about like how to use deep brain stimulation in depression. And then the second uh, question was, hey, you said patients are evaluated in what kind of scales? And then th there are always follow up questions by students. And I would consider this is good because that means they are reading what ChatGPT is, is giving them and they are analyzing and then they are asking further uh, questions. So I give this as an example to students in the class that you have good, oops, I think this is the format when we put it in <laughs> the drive. These are good examples how you uh, answer my question and these are bad examples. So I will start with the bad examples. So the students just like said, okay, so I ask, these are the questions that I ask. What's the relationship between metabolism and blah, blah, blah? Does the longer, so it's just like direct questions and no follow up. And then they analyzed or, and summarized what ChatGPT said. And I told students, and they got zero for their uh, uh, answers because this is not meaningful conversation. I want you to, to dig deeper uh, in your uh, uh, conversation. Uh, this is, for example, uh, so what are some causes of schizophrenia? Hey, I mean, that's, that's not what I want you to use ChatGPT for. On the other hand, for example, and these are only a uh, few questions from so many, like maybe 20 questions from one student, all those greens from one student. Can you compare that and contrast these three cyclic antidepressants? Those three types are uh, antidepressants in the treatment of depression and why one would be used for patient and, okay, so that's important question indeed, yeah? Because we just like maybe mention a little bit about it in the class, but the, the student is digging further. And then, okay, I see, SSRI is safer, but then it's like always follow up. That means the student is reading and analyzing and maybe they are comparing with what they learned in the class. And then they following up, say, for example, here, uh, in my pharmacology course, I also learned about antidepressants. How are they used in, in anxiety? 
I mean, that's an important question, indeed, to think, like to link uh, different things together and to get something from the lecture to uh, 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 propose it to ChatGPT. So that's why I concluded based on, on this, uh, as I said, this was my first uh, experience uh, in using ChatGPT and I, I learned some uh, 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 lessons from here. So th only this uh, uh, question gave me idea about like, how students can use this for uh, as supplemental tutoring and very much personalized. What, what some students find difficult, others don't find. Okay, so, so this is, I found it very, very uh, helpful in, uh, for students as tutoring, uh, explaining uh, complex topics or clarifications from things like the class. I cannot, I have 100 students. I encourage students to ask questions, but sometimes some are shy, some uh, just like send me some emails. So uh, ChatGPT indeed is helping a lot in clarifying some uh, difficult uh, concepts and discuss concepts that they find uh, difficult. Personalization, I found this is very important as well. I mean, it's just like then they can tailor, uh, they, the, the, they can use ChatGPT to clear, tailor uh, th their learning. Uh, interactive learning, as you saw, it's like I, I, th they learn how to communicate and then follow up with uh, questions. Uh, curiosity, uh, it's interesting because there are some topics that we never covered in the class and I could see them in their questions. Okay, so that means ChatGPT just like threw one word and then, oh, I'm curious about learning about this more and then they dig further so I like that and then uh, I have some students who uh, whose English as me second language so uh, I'm, I'm sure that 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 helped them a lot like in, in translating some of the terms in pharmacology we use a lot of terms and some of them even for English speakers don't make sense so because they are they are Greek or, or Latin so uh, translating using ChatGPT for translating uh, I found it very very uh, helpful okay so I will uh, speak about how I used uh, ChatGPT in the current uh, course that I'm teaching now it's a neuropsychopharmacology so this is online course and uh, as I said students take this usually in fourth year so they are senior and this is, as I said, totally uh, uh, online. Uh, I designed the course that each uh, week uh, there's a module. So I start with the objective learning uh, 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 from this uh, week. Then uh, there are uh, icons that take students logically how they should start their week. So they sh should start reading and then viewing the lectures. I already rec recorded the lectures for them and I have like a PDF with outlines of the lectures. And then the homework uh, activities and supplemental material. I put some videos, some news, BBC, CNN, anything that's re related to the topic. So here, this are how the, the assignments look like. So there might be multiple choice question and discussions. And this year I added Ask ChatGPT. So every week they have to ask ChatGPT. And this time it's, it's graded. So I can give you example of how I used in week two Ask ChatGPT. So uh, review the learning outcomes. That means they have to review these. Okay, because I always tell them, hey, by the end of this week, these are what I want you to have. If you have all these skills and uh, the, 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 the knowledge, you achieved, you accomplished the, the outcomes, the learning uh, outcomes. So I asked them to review the objectives and then use ChatGPT to gain deeper understanding in specific aspects that they found uh, difficult. So they are required to first to, to, to review and then to select and then based on that, I want them to uh, ask to, to clarify and explore more that topic. And then if I stop there, okay, they will again, like they do very much similar to what they did in the junior class, molecular pharmacology, they can dig further. But I want them to, to move to, to higher level of, of just like being creative. And that's why I ask them to draw. And Drawing, they have to do it themselves. That means it's like um, after their conversation with ChatGPT, then they will create something, okay? And I am sure then that it's not like they, they just like pick up the information and 
wrote them, so they, they created themselves something. And that's one example of, of one student's uh, assignment, uh, because they have to, to so the, the, the student chose one, the, the systems and then how the uh, cells of GABA and glutamate uh, work. And then uh, the student said, because the, there is question, uh, include ad additional sources, of course, that I always ask them, and um, uh, explain how it relates to the learning objective. So I can see that uh, for this assignment, so that's the, the student's answer after uh, they, they, they drew this. Uh, I see that ChatGPT wasn't helpful uh, as I had hoped. Uh, I asked if could, it could give me a simple diagram, it didn't. However, it helped me like giving some information, which is good. So that means students are really aware of what ChatGPT is able to give them and what they, they need to figure out more. And I can tell you that uh, I use ChatGPT to help me uh, creating the rubric for this uh, assignment as well. Um, so this is uh, another uh, question. And here I moved even further. I asked students, OK, again, to choose something uh, um, about the, the topic that we are discussing this week, dopamine and noradrenaline, and then think about some disorders that are related to underactivity and overactivity of these disorders. I asked, you can use ChatGPT, but then you need to find definitely other uh, sources of information. And this time I said, OK, cross-check all information and identify and correct at least one piece of inaccurate information in ChatGPT responses. So every time they have to, to look at what ChatGPT gave me, and then they need to go to scientific articles. Okay, so they need to, to read. And as you see here, then the students are, are putting really a lot of uh, articles. So I am kind of forcing them to start here and then read more in uh, real scientific uh, articles. It's interesting that, um, so, this is also after the student had long uh, chat GBT because I asked them to include their conversation. So after the conversation, I didn't put it here, so they, they were able to draw this nice uh, diagram. And then that's one of the reflection or feedback. Uh, I, uh, it, this was actually such a great exercise. I really love how I was able to piece together what I learned from my class, chat GBT, and other and my own research. And whenever I get to, uh, stuck on a topic, like I didn't understand why, would was blah, blah, blah. so I, I honestly thought this would be the error that I would find in ChatGPT. But I checked with sources and I found it's not. So you see, this sentence is really very interesting because the student is, is careful now. They, because I asked them, pick up uh, inaccurate. Uh, information and they are trying now to pick up to, to, and then to compare everything. This is very good exercise because that helps them analyze not only the information coming from ChatGPT and that's my purpose. It's not only about ChatGPT. How I can create like students who are critically thinking, who are analyzing the data from wherever this this data come uh, from. Um, this is another uh, student's uh, response. So I was able to cross-reference the uh, disorders uh, with publications, and I was able to find one error. So ChatGPT is claiming that bipolar uh, uh, disorder is caused by dopamine overactivity. However, I researched even more and saw that there was little evidence for this hypothesis. So, and the, they are putting uh, 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 scientific papers. I mean, that, they are making effort to, to really get the truth, to, to get the facts, not only just like put information. And that's the, the, the advantage of like uh, using ChatGPT, not only to, to help student uh, low level tutoring or learning or understanding, but to have this exercise by students to, to analyze any piece of uh, information. So that's why uh, I uh, concluded from these exercises in this course, which is higher than the, the first course, that students, uh, especially this is online course, so ChatGPT or 
gen AI in, in general can help uh, independent uh, learning uh, research. Uh, they start ChatGPT and then they go to search scientific paper. They are more than any time they are reading scientific papers because of ChatGPT. Creativity, uh, because when I tell them to draw, uh, they can use ChatGPT just like to give them idea what to put in that drawing. So the brainstorming, uh, problem solving, because when they find discrepancies, differences in the information, then they need to find. So where's where's the truth? Then they try to 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 have like. A, more uh, uh, information or, or more real uh, data. And then reflective thinking. Uh, as you see, always my last uh, piece of the question, reflect. Tell me what you learned. And I always like to uh, end with metacognition. It's like to be aware what I know, what I learned, how I was, how I became because of this exercise. And I will finish with uh, the last course, Principles of Pharmacology. So this is for PharmD uh, students, second year. And so this is in uh, person. So I have 48 students. And so I m use ChatGPT this time for group works. So all the assignments uh, using ChatGPT are group work, teamwork. And uh, for example, this is uh, one question that was uh, last week. So choose a disease, conditions such as hypertension, anxiety, then they pick up. I just like make them pick up. And then they select the drugs that uh, can be used to treat. So here, because I, there's big load of work. So they might need to, to choose four or five drugs. They need to search a lot. So that's why. Uh, I ask them to start with ChatGBT to explain the mechanisms of these many drugs because then they distribute the work. I have like six students working on, in, in teams. And then I ask them that they need to finish with infographic or poster. So this is one example of the poster. So that's how they start with ChatGBT and they get idea and I just like go around and I hear them like, hey, ChatGPT said this. Uh, no, and, and I checked this. So it's like that it's, it's helping them not only, of course, getting the, the, the information and then going to read the scientific paper, but also the discussion uh, among each other. Because the way that someone writes the question, you might get different answers or like longer answer or shorter answers by uh, ChatGPT. Uh, these are also other examples, all based on uh, the, the discussions and uh, the, the question that they all start from uh, uh, using ChatGPT. Uh, I want just like to point out here is that um, I always uh, ask them to, to just like ask ChatGPT Ch about even how you create your uh, poster or, or infographic. Uh, so that's why I, fi I find like this is really very nice and informative uh, um, uh, poster. So also, um, as you see here, that the question was about uh, many drugs that they need and to, to see how the chemical structure of the drug affects how it works, okay? By changing only a small part of the drug might make it totally acting differently or having more uh, 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 efficacy or, or potency. Um, so that's always also verification of the information. And that's why I, I to get the full grade, they need to put all the references, the, the scientific references that they crossed with uh, ChatGPT. And so based on the exercise that uh, I have been doing uh, in, in this course, uh, the, far, the PharmD course, I concluded that ChatGPT helped students in just like preliminary research because that really reduced the time. If, I mean, I have 48 students, they are working on eight diseases, if each one of the work might take maybe seven hours or eight hours. And I ask them to create all these posters in the class. So that's big work, okay? So I find it very 
uh, helpful when they use ChatGPT and distribute and, and they divide the work and they get the work done, they cross the references. So, uh, so I, I get really, I, I maximize the, 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 the um, uh, getting the knowledge and uh, the citation by using ChatGPT. Uh, idea generation, I can see uh, students when they are discussing how they, they are uh, discussing how ChatGPT is giving them ideas, collaboration, critical thinking, as I said, I, I, I saw it here because uh, they are always analyzing the data, uh, equitable access to learning materials indeed. I, I feel this is very important. Uh, I cannot say that about ChatGPT 4, but at least like ChatGPT the, the 3 or 3 and half is available for everyone, so everyone has access to this uh, 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 program. And then uh, time management, as I said, decreasing the time uh, of students doing this uh, uh, assignment from 8 hours to just like uh, 40 minutes, and then uh, finally, even uh, creative visual uh, representation of data. They need to do the posters in the class. I mean, one poster might take hours, so just like by brainstorming. I don't ask them to use ChatGPT to create the poster. It's not like, so I created indeed those by ChatGPT 4, but I can tell you it's not good enough to create really scientific uh, uh, posters because it doesn't know the text inside. It just like gives me language that's not understood. So that's why, but at least like it gives ideas how to organize uh, the, or, or format uh, the uh, poster or infographic. And that's it. Thank you. I'll let them all take that. You, you, you figure out <laughs> online. I have not tried to do it online yet. Well, I, I, uh, I think um, the use of ChatGPT for different courses, so that's why I started by saying those are different courses. So undergrad, PharmD, like grad, uh, online, and person. You, you need to tailor the ChatGPT to, to use it for different uh, um, format of the class. So for online, it's a little bit more uh, tricky because students are by, are by themselves. So there is no interaction. So you want to have ChatGPT more fun, more interacting. So that's why like all these drawings and uh, creative uh, work. While in the class, for example, the farm D <coughs> So the ChatGPT question is like, start the research with ChatGPT, okay, but then finish with scientific papers. And they are discussing with each other. So ChatGPT is only to uh, speed up the, the process of like thinking and search for uh, uh, information. So I think there are different uh, roles for ChatGPT in, in different courses. Yeah, I, I, I don't teach like lower uh, class, like first year and second year, so I don't know how I will use ChatGPT in these uh, classes. And so I, I really like your idea of, to my understanding, they uploaded their dialogue with ChatGPT. Yes. Um, and you gave examples of good uh, questions that analyzed what ChatGPT had mm -hmm. said and then kind of not so good uh, questions. Um, I'm wondering, because the numbers in your classes were quite high, I'm just wondering is that very grading in t in intensive um, to kind of pick apart, you know, what was what's truly good analysis and what's not, um, or, or was it kind of manageable? Mm -hmm. Could you use AI to grade <laughs> those? I have TAs, <laughs> that's the good thing. I have TAs, especially for online courses, I need more TAs than the in-person uh, ones. But also indeed, 
In all my slides I, uh, and presentation, I spoke about how I use ChatGPT for students' learning, but I didn't speak about how I use ChatGPT to help me in teaching and improving my teaching. And one of them is uh, rubric. So it helped me a lot, like by, okay, I throw the question. So this is the question that I'm, I'm, I'm asking the students. So can, help, can you help me for the grading? How can I put rubric? Then for the TA, it's just like the rubric. They click, tick, 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 and then the grade is done. Yeah? So that, that's one advantage of, of using ChatGPT. And sometimes even for, especially for PharmD uh, course, I use ChatGPT to create a clinical scenario or cases. I say, hey, I, I, this drug has this toxicity and this uh, efficacy with, with numbers. I, I throw the numbers, I throw just like very dry knowledge and I ask ChatGPT to create clinical scenario. And it's wonderful. Of course, you have to be careful because you need to revise, but it, it decreased my time in creating uh, quizzes and questions for the exam to 10 persons. The other thing I really like is yeah, these drawings that they could yeah. do um, and kind of upload. I wondered, was it, did you have to ask a very specific question to get different kinds of drawings? Um, or did you find that the drawings kind of repeated themselves if they, if they found some kind of resource online? Or? So if you see that uh, the drawing, uh, the drawings are mainly based on the objective. So that's why I ask, choose one of the objective, uh, the learning uh, uh, outcomes, the ones that are still difficult for you and just like go dig there. So definitely if there are like six out outcomes, so there will be at least six choices by students. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Um, can we give them a quick round of applause before we do the Q&A? Um, I had a momentary um, sort of anxiety-inducing flip-out moment just now because my clock on my tablet did not update, and it said it, it was still 2.38. And then I looked at, up there and on my watch and said, oh, no, that's definitely wrong. Um, so crisis averted. Um, so for the final part of today's uh, session, I wanted to have a Q&A session, and I wanted to know what would be more useful for you all. I have a set of uh, five questions that were brought, um, uh, or that were written down on the registration form that we can go through, um, but if you all have any general questions, um, I would love to hear from you first before we get to those. Um, does that sound okay? Okay, uh, so I'll just open it up to the floor if anybody has any general questions or specific ones um, for our panelists. While y'all are thinking, um, I wanted to make two comments that I thought of during your portion. Um, the first was you had shown a, um, an example of the students asking the good questions or um, not so great questions. And one thing that we've learned kind of anecdotally uh, talking with other faculty is that sometimes the students uh, find it more helpful and accessible to ask though to ask more questions to the chat that they would be willing to ask to the instructor or the TA because uh, they feel like uh, they don't, they're not gonna be judged. Not saying that we would judge them, um, but sometimes it's easier to chat with a chat bot um, instead of chatting with somebody where they can say, didn't we just go over that? Um, so that's one thing that I, I wanted to uh, mention that kind of uh, thought of that. And the second was, We've done a couple of uh, AI panels, and the students absolutely love correcting the responses that um, that chatbots and or ChatGPT would give us, and it's something that we've seen that the students just they just love doing it. So I highly recommend uh, incorporating some of that because then they can really see, as you're pointing out, like yeah, they, they could see like oh this is this is not we shouldn't take this as face value, um, and there are, there's a really um, good application to um, critically thinking about it. So um, just two thoughts that I had. Anyway. Um, question. Yes. Oh, this is not really a question. Okay. <laughs> Can you know more about the first presenter? I'm sorry, I can't see it. Adrian. 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 Hi. Hi. In your presentation, you mentioned the equity. I think this is both actually. But in yours, you were talking about how you can kind of bridge the divide between those who are tech savvy and maybe those who are a little bit more anxious about tech. And I had never heard of that before. I think that's really interesting. I would love to know more about how AI can. Where I'm coming from, our program is 
I don't know how AI on its own will reduce the equity divide or the opportunity gap. The reason I, one of the reasons I included an activity was to try and help students that would not naturally go check it out to help get them a little bit more on board. So perhaps you have examples for how the tool, I mean, we can design activities, but again, we are kind of forcing the students to come along and attempt to master the tool when perhaps they might not choose to. And I had many students say, I was, I'd heard it was bad. Like, I, I thought I wasn't supposed to use it because it was bad. It was like the Wikipedia, you know, of, of, of college or something. And I'm like, it's, it's, it's a tool and you got to figure out how you're going to get on board the bus and what the weaknesses are and stuff. So I don't know any way it itself would reduce equity. I'm just worried that unless people like us help students use it, if they will, it will cause worse equity issues. Well, I feel like uh, since it is accessible, uh, by anyone. I'm, I'm speaking about the free ones. Indeed, I, I got small grant <laughs> here internally uh, to use uh, AI and to, to assess uh, the use of AI in, in uh, 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 education. And I was planning to get a license for my students to get ChatGPT 4, the plus, because I know not all students can afford to pay $20 monthly. And um, unfortunately, um, we're still in the process by OIT to approve it. And it's already we are in the third week. So yeah, I mean, th that's one thing. So if in the future we feel that, hey, I mean, there are really some uh, a gen AI that are much more useful for students and we want them to use, but they are paid, maybe then the university can do something about like, okay, making them available for everyone. So, And, that, and the university that, is creating a yeah. Zot GPT service, but, it, but it's only, I think, faculty have access to it. And it's, it it's, did not work last week. Okay, so it's still in its early phases. So I, I'm, I think that will help solve, and other campuses have done that, to create an in-house mm -hmm. um, chat service, which does solve some of the data mining drama associated with it, but we're not quite there yet. So that might be the way forward. But again, not every class will find that particular tool helpful and might need a slightly different tool. Yeah, thank you for remembering that, yeah. So uh, just because I'm mic'd and he's not, uh, Danny reminded us that using the AI tools for translation purposes, um, and perhaps you're trying to explain something to a relative um, who needs it explained more simply or whatever, that, that there is that benefit. But compared to, for example, translation to Google Translate or any, I mean, definitely I would recommend my students to use ChatGPT because at least like the terms that the terms in pharmacology, you will not get them in Google, um, yeah. But I, I wonder too, like, how does one learn to synthesize? Or how does one learn to read deeply? And I think both of you have given a way forward thinking about this with a tool like this, which is, it seemed like both of you were, were sharing practices that had a metacognitive component always at work in them. So it, that seems really important, is asking the students to think about the veracity of what they got back, uh, what worked for them and why, where are they suspicious, uh, and then the transcript of the conversation could be a way of teaching or getting meta with the class about how you ask. You kept saying, dig deeper, dig deeper, Amal. And I think that's the sort of language of, of analysis, analysis and reading. Uh, and a lot of times that seems to be a process that comes slowly. Like synthesis is really hard. And so I just wonder how you think about like, you, 
quick efficiencies of the tool that can put things together, but but the sort of process of learning to synthesize is one that's sort of traditionally thought of as over time, learning to read, learning to see where those gaps are, and then to make those connections. And I, I don't have an answer to it, but I think that's something that you're sort of helping me think about. Uh, and I wonder if some of the students' resistance is sort of connected to that too. So, I don't know, can I so my strategy, if you look, I mean, f in, in each of these courses, uh, to hook the students to the right, to the correct use of ChatGPT. Uh, because if I leave it to students, and that's one of the disadvantage, if we want to speak about disadvantage, cheating is very easy, okay? If they just like, they, they can get the answer. So that's why I, when I say dig, but it, I, I want them to combine both speeding up the learning process and deeper uh, learning and metacognition. So that's my strategy. And to get there to, to where I want, like the metacognition, I want to hook them. And that's to get them addicted to digging further. And because I know even me, OK, so if I start to be interested in something, oh, tell me more. Oh, but then you said this. C can we do this? So, so you need to hook. So that's why I start, hey, just like get quick S search first and see how you go further. On the scientific, on the farm D, um, the, the speed is just like instead of searching, for example, the disorders and the mechanisms, that can be done in few seconds, but then from there, instead of spending one hour just like searching Google, which takes me to 100 papers, then to read, no. Then I take those from ChatGPT and then I, I go. So I, I, I still want them to read. So to make them read more, they have to be interested. To make them interested, hey, just like go and dig further and you will like it and then you will be addicted. So addiction. So that, that's my strategy, <laughs> to go slowly Very pharmacological with students. Yes. I have plan. <laughs> I teach neuropsychopharmacology, and I'm a neuroscientist, so I know how to hook students. <laughs> yeah, I want my students to be addicted to reading, right? That's exactly, kind of thing. exactly. But you cannot just like suddenly tell them, hey, go there. So that's why I'm, I'm using all these steps <laughs> to finally, hopefully, go there. So I have that set of five questions, but y'all were so good at reading my mind that we have answered four of them already. <laughs> um, so we just have the one question, which I think Amal, you, you, had, um, you alluded to it earlier, and I'm wondering if both of you have any thoughts about this, which is the fifth question here, um, talking about how it can help the faculty. How can it help us grade real homework, or if it can be used to grade real homework? And in this case, this person asked about short answer problems rather than multiple choice. Do you have any thoughts about that? Um, I have none. Um, I have short answer problems, um, but they tend to be, I believe, ungradable by AI. I use TAs. I do use Gradescope to help present and organize the grading. Um, and Gradescope has a grouping but I don't think it's seen my paper quiz questions the, the like. I, it's, I don't think my questions would fare well. So I have no experience in grading short answer problems. Um, and you use rubrics, so. Uh, until now, it is helping me in creating rubric, which makes grading much faster by my TA, because then it's just like uh, ticking. And however, I recently started to uh, try it, okay, but I haven't uh, applied, okay, I'm still in the experimental uh, stage uh, to use it for uh, grading. For example, myself, when I use ChatGPT sometimes when I'm writing grant or whatever, I say, hey, does this paragraph look good? So that's how I interact with ChatGPT. I don't ask ChatGPT to give me. I give it and say, hey, does it look good? What do you think about this, okay? So then, if I use the same framework and for a grading, then I will put the uh, students' uh, answers uh, into 
how do you think about it? So based on this rubric that it created itself. So I'm still in the experiment. I don't know how fast it will be like to have like 100 students or, or 60 students. So I don't know. So what I'm, I'm hearing is we need a follow-up workshop later <laughs> on down the road where you're going to come and tell us what you're, what you're finding yeah. out. OK, great. Hopefully by the end of this year, I will figure out. <laughs> Excellent. Sounds good. Um, any other questions, thoughts, comments? All right, then let's go ahead and give them another round of applause for coming out and showing us.